last chapter, I've already made a brief reference to Moses' charge to fathers, but let's take a closer look. In this passage in Deuteronomy, we find directives that apply to all of us as parents, no matter what our cultural situation. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. Simply stated, Moses was charging the children of Israel to worship and love only one God. They were not to engage in any form of pagan idolatry. And as parents today, we too are to serve and love God with all our hearts. Our children should see in us a deep sense of commitment to God and a deep desire to do his will, not saying one thing and doing something else. Moses next charged parents in Israel to take advantage of all the natural opportunities to teach their children the word of God. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. And so, as parents today, we should look for those natural opportunities, those teachable moments to share God's truth with their children. When we're out for a stroll, when we're tucking them into bed at night, and when we get up and face the day's challenges. Obviously, this kind of teaching will not happen if we're not looking for these opportunities. And it certainly won't take place if we do not love God with all of our hearts. Even if we try, our children will know that our words of instruction really don't match our lifestyle. In Old Testament days, Moses was saying to the parents in Israel, don't let that happen. Be real, be honest, be consistent. I must admit that I've certainly missed some of these opportunities of father, more than I'd like to admit, but I, I wanna share one very memorable experience. I had the wonderful opportunity to prepare counselors at Word of Life, a camping ministry in Upper State, New York. And during this particular summer, we arrived early and settled in on a beautiful 90-acre island in the middle of Skrill Lake. The counselors weren't scheduled to arrive for a couple of days, so we had time to ourselves as a family. I remember one evening we went down to the beach area. It was already dark, but it was a beautiful, moonlit night with the lights from the Scroon Lake village shimmering across the lake and it suddenly dawned on me that this was an unusual opportunity to practice Moses instructions. As the children were playing I started a fire and then slipped away and found some marshmallows and when I returned we began to sing some songs our two daughters had learned as campfire girls and while we were roasting marshmallows we very naturally segued into some simple gospel songs that our children knew. I then suggested that we pray and thank God for this wonderful opportunity to be together as a family and in this beautiful setting. The children were totally responsive and I'll never forget my oldest. She was about eight. She stood up with eyes wide open, looking up into the starlit sky she then began to pray, something like this. Dear God, thank you for the moon, the stars, this lake, and thank you that we can be with our parents here on this island. Well, I can't recall all she said that night, but I remember this. I could never have, on my own, created the incredible environment for this worship moment. We were sitting in a gigantic natural cathedral. I remember thinking, I almost missed this opportunity. Well, you get the point. The most natural moments in teaching our children are, as instructed in the Word of God, those spontaneous times that happen on a regular basis. When we sit in our house, when we walk by the way, when we lie down, when we rise up. This doesn't mean, of course, that we shouldn't plan specific times to read God's Word and discuss its meaning, 
But even as adults, isn't it true that what we remember the most from God's word happens during the natural events in our lives? Let me remind you of one other thing to encourage you in your discussion. I also mentioned this briefly in this chapter, but let me underscore a very important biblical guideline for fathering God's way. It comes from Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. You are witnesses and so is God. How devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave towards you believers. Here Paul was reinforcing Moses' message to the children of Israel with his own life to model what we teach. But then he reflected on something that is incredibly important in fathering. And here he becomes very specific in referring to the father figure. Just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children. Paul definitely ministered to each one of these new believers in Thessalonica, just as a father should minister to each one of his own children. Well, the lesson is clear. Let's not just rear a family. Let's rear individual children in our family, one by one. Each one is different, and each one has a different personality, different needs, different concerns, and different challenges in life. Now, this, of course, is God's ideal, and most of us have fallen short in reaching the standard that God lays out for us in the Scriptures. I know I have, but let's begin where we are at this moment in our lives with our children, no matter what their age is, or, as I can testify, God gives us new opportunity, grandparents. God bless you as you discuss the questions here on page 206.